inga mana, inga rio, inga rangatira ma, tēnei te mihi ki a koutou. Kia tū tika ai te whari tapu o Ngāpui. Toi tū te marae, toi tū te hapu, toi tū te iwi. Te pihopa ki te taitaukarau, pihopa ki tō, nei rā te mihi mahana. Ko waiau, ko pukiki wiriki te maunga, ko hingaia te awa, ko pahurihuri te ara awa, ko Ajax te waka, ko Ngāti Pākehā te iwi, ko Cityside Baptist te Whakarakia, ko Picard te hapu, ko Alfred Christopher Picard, tuku tupuna, ko Ivan Rawa ko Carol Okumato, ko Margaret Picard Wahini Rangatira, ko Olivia Rawa ko Amy Ngā Tamariki ko Andrew Picard tō kuingoa. Nō reira, tēnā koutou. Tēnā koutou. I want to also, before I begin, just give thanks to the organisers of the event. Um, I think it's been a really interesting time and I think really interesting kōrero. Um, I also want to give particular um, shout out and thanks and mihi to Papa Ruka, uh, Luke Carmorgan for all your support on this journey of this research particularly and Jordan and Eugene and Thomas um, and James and Natua, um, particularly those of the Tainui Waka, um, been really important for your journey so thank you. Mm. The entanglement of education, Christianity and colonialism meant that British education was an essentially pedagogic enterprise, and a particularly Christian one at that. British Christianity provided the vital networks, relationships, ideologies and justifications for the civilising mission of education within the webs of empire. Christianity was represented not just by missionaries and church leaders, but also politicians and policy makers and educationalists across and in the colonies and the metropole in London. So in this paper, I want to examine the partnership, formal partnership, that was developed between the British government and the mission societies to provide residential industrial education that attempted to transform indigenous peoples from heathenism and barbarism to the superiority of British Christianity and civilization. In particular, I want to focus on the mutually beneficial partnership between Sir George Grey and Archdeacon Robert Maunsell to establish a system of residential mission schools as part of a Christian humanitarian intervention that was seeking to assimilate Māori into European life ways and ways of knowing. I do want to acknowledge that the paper discusses the painful realities of residential mission schools and the land wars. They're not polite academic inquiries, but discussions of imperial conquest, slaughter, the dispossession of whenua, the displacement of iwi, and the entrenchment of intergenerational social and economic disadvantage. And my subject position as a Pākehā is as an inheritor and inhabitor of the unearned privileges of settler colonialism. So the focus of my paper is on Pākehā settlers who utilise Christianity and Christian theology to justify structuring the myths of white supremacy into educational policy and reality. I don't have the whakapapa or the knowledge of Mataranga Māori or Te Reo Māori to interpret or make sense of Māori realities or Māori agency. That's not my area. So the focus is particularly upon the webs of empire in British Christian empire, primarily Protestant politicians and missionaries and church leaders. Mission societies believed in the need to establish systems of education for native children to rescue them from ignorance and train them in the knowledge of Christianity, their words. The CMS believed in the need to extract children from the polluting influence of their home environment and receive them into the care of missionaries and mission schools that would mold them to become, quote, agents of civilization and Christianity. During the early 19th century, the British government developed policies for universal education at home and then in the colonies. The government partnered with mission societies to co-construct educational policies and practices as a humanitarian intervention. And claims of humanitarianism are not always humane. And recognising education as a humanitarian project does not avoid the immense violence and inequality that was wrought by colonialism. 
The educational interventions of Maunsell and Gray enacted in New Zealand were a local expression of these wider educational policies and practices within and across the empire. Maunsell was a very talented, sacrificial and hard-working, resilient person who developed one of the largest mission schools in the country. He was appointed superintendent and archdeacon for the Lower Waikato, and he strove to develop a sustainable system of education on the meagre CMS budgets. He was responsible for training many of the missionaries who went on to develop other mission schools and run them throughout the Lower Waikato and beyond. Um, he was responsible, he also um, was an outstanding linguist and interpreted the scriptures from Hebrew into Te Reo Māori and to Te Paiparatapu, um, as well as procuring signatures to the Treaty of Waitangi. I say the treaty because it was the only English version used. Along with his many achievements, Maunsell endured much hardship, including the death of two wives, severe illnesses, fires which consumed most of their home and possessions, and threats of death during the Waikato Wars. Sir George Grey was raised in an evangelical Christian home. And he believed that duty to God and uh, to the Queen and her empire was inextricably linked to duty to God. He viewed his appointment as governor as divine providence, and his plans for racial amalgamation were an outworking of God's purposes for the country. He said, You are either God's ministers to give effect to God's desires for the welfare of creatures, or you are turning traitors to that duty to prevent his wishes for the welfare of all being carried out. Gray's reputation grew with a report where he wrote outlining a scheme for colonial, uh, for colonial race relations and the governance of Indigenous Australians. Gray urged that previous attempts at amalgamation in Australia had failed because they'd allowed Indigenous Australians to retain elements of their barbarous customs and laws to coexist with British customs and law. And instead, he insisted that the Aboriginals must be taught that British laws superseded their own to prevent them from remaining, quote, hopelessly immersed in their present state of barbarism. In New Zealand, Gray developed these ideas of amalgamation more formally through the establishment of institutions like residential mission schools. Maunsell arrived in Aotearoa as a convinced educationalist. Uh, whilst the CMS was a mission society, he told them there was an organic relationship between Christianity, patriotism, and benevolence that unites education with missionary labor. Schools are, quote, the pivots and springs of missionary success. At Maraitai, or now we would say Port Waikato, Maunsell established a school that by the end of 1839 had an average daily attendance of 70 attendees, and it rose to over 100 in the early 1840s. Maunsell's views of Gray didn't get off to a particularly auspicious start. Maunsell objected to Gray's heavy-handed response to the conflict with Te Rauparaha, um, and Maunsell told the CMS that Gray was inexperienced and that he was very disappointed in him. Uh, he appealed to the committee to influence the home government to, quote, compel our governor to be more forbearing and more just. Despite this lumpy start, Maunsell and Gray established a friendship that lasted for nearly 40 years, writing to one another in their old age. In early 1847, Maunsell met Gray in person for the first time in Auckland and exchanged views on education and the native race. Gray offered to assist Maunsell's labour in any way he could. Following their meeting, Maunsell took the opportunity to write to Gray about education. He reminded Gray of their shared, view, shared views of Māori and schooling, and he said, Māori should be regarded as wards in chancery or wards of the state. They are, quote, a strange mixture of the craft and spirit of the man with the improvidence and fickleness of the child until, until properly disciplined. Maunsell proposed a system where the government, as guardians, should oversee the sale of Māori lands and take their cut from the proceeds. The remaining money should go to building roads, which benefited those who used them, but also those who built them. Whilst this was a good, it was not, quote, most suited to their present condition, as Māori were not yet ready to be entrusted with managing their property or money. The real good said Maunsell, was education, which was needed for the sake of Māori and the colony. Without education, he said, nine-tenths of the population would continue to be, quote, wild, lawless, roaming warriors, disturb themselves and disturbing others. The language is brutal. Whereas with education, they would be, quote, induced to settle down as useful members of society, fearing God and respecting lawful authority. <laughs> 
Mortsel highlighted the lack of resource and, the, the, uh, and labor that the mission schools faced. There was only 24 CMS missionaries to oversee the spiritual and secular issues of an island nearly the size of Great Britain on a tiny wee budget of like 10,000 pounds. Missionaries could not attend to one location because they had to travel vast distances to go all the different native settlements. And the work could not be entrusted to native teachers because, quote, their characters are too unstable and their knowledge too scanty to enable us to look for anything permanent or solid from them. What was needed were residential industrial schools and the financial resource to maintain them. Because of the, C the expense, the CMS would only support but not maintain residential schools. But day schools, more to believe, could not bring about the necessary change in Māori habits and customs that civilization required. So this resonated with Gray and as well as the wider policies of the British government. He reminded Gray that it was through the influence of the missionaries that Māori, interestingly, in, in, you know, in Ngāpui, <laughs> it land, um, voluntarily ceded their lands, he said, which, of course, we know uh, the tribunal thinks very differently, as the Ngāpui do. And that some of the tax revenue from those lands should be set aside for the mission schools. So the missionaries were agents in ensuring that Māori gave up sovereignty and the wealth that comes from that should be given to mission schools. Given Gray's character, Maunsell told the CMS it was very improbable he would reply. Despite Maunsell's doubts, Gray did reply, thanking him for his very interesting letter. He agreed with Maunsell on the need to introduce a good and permanent system of education into New Zealand, which required a fixed and unfailing fund devoted to the purpose, but it's probably two or three years away, he said. The topic could only be satisfactorily discussed in conversation, which he hoped they could soon do. Gray's unexpected reply quickly prompted Morsel to write his own, telling Gray his letter would be, quote, a source of much gratification to my brother missionaries, um, the relationship between government and missionaries. And they would be delighted to hear Gray's plans for the Māori education. At this time, Gray was devising the 1847 Education Ordinance, and its success relied heavily upon the support of the missionaries. Gray invited Maunsell, along with Bishop Selwyn and Octavius Hadfield, to offer his views on the draft. The ordinance offered government funding for residential mission schools to provide religious education and industrial training conducted in English. Teachers would be appointed by the manager of the schools. Schools were to submit to official government inspections, and the cost of the system cannot exceed more than 1 20th of the revenue of the colony. Maltzer replied to Gray, noting that he had high hopes for the bill because it was based on the principles of liberality and justice. He agreed with the principle of assisting rather than maintaining the schools. Though money was needed to procure agricultural instruments like plows and fences and flour mills for industrial training. And so whilst Maltzer supported the, the teaching of English as the ideal, and you know, just a quick aside, I, I do want to challenge the idea that the missionaries were very active in... Um, retaining te reo Māori. I think it's a much more complex issue, issue than that. Um, he noted that it was impractical to just teach in English in some of the, the, the purely native districts. In his hints on schools against, uh, amongst the Aborigines in New Zealand, Maunsell held that English, quote, should be cultivated in the school as an object of attraction, as of utility. Doesn't sound like someone who's preserving te reo as, as the form of instruction. However, the wandering lifestyle of Māori, their desire to continue associating with other Māori, their previous bad education and consequent bad habits formed, quote, a great obstacle, said Maunsell. Gray's ordinance for establishing in residential industrial schooling was an extension of the assimilationist ideas and instructions he'd been given before he arrived in Aotearoa. Um, Dr. James K. Shuttleworth was the secretary for the Council on Education in Britain and a leading educationalist of his time, the leading educationalist. He was a Christian, and K. Shuttleworth believed Christianity and education were central sources for civilization. He drew on his medical experience working among the poor in Britain to design industrial school uh, models to be used first amongst Britain's poor and destitute orphans and the Irish savages, and then later as an ideal for British colonies. He was a strong believer in personal responsibility and the need to hold people accountable for their own misfortunes. Christian civilization for a semi-barbarous class required the development of moral and physical training, along with religious and educational instruction to mutually inform each other. <clears throat> Though industry and religious instruction, through industry and religious instruction, the destitute or savage children will be turned into, quote, efficient and virtuous members of society and promote the growth of a truly Christian civilization.
1847, he wrote brief practical suggestions for industrial schooling among the coloured races of the British colonies for use initially in Jamaica and then among all the coloured races of the British Empire. The objectives um, of Kay Shuttleworth's system were to inculcate and promote the principles and influences of Christianity, um, accustom native children to the habits of self-control and moral discipline, and spread the knowledge of the English language as an agent of civilization. Along with teaching, writing, and arithmetic, he hoped to make schools the means of improving the peasantry by te teaching proper diets, cleanliness, ventilation, and clothing. <clears throat> Students were to be trained in the household economy and the cultivation of the cottage industry. And I would say, uh, in, a, in a different work, the idea of civilization and cultivation, the cultivation of souls and the cultivation of land, go hand in hand together theologically in the British mind. Um, K. Shuttleworth's industrial model aimed at making indigenous people comfortable laborers or peasants who enjoyed improved conditions through British civilizing habits and Christianity. The costs of industrial education were offset by exploiting students as free labor and equipping them for a future as the working class. Ranganui Walker argues that in the New Zealand context, the industrial curriculum prepared Māori, quote, for a future as a laboring underclass, the brown British proletariat. Gray corresponded with Kay Shuttleworth on education and read and forwarded a copy of his brief practical suggestions to Maunsell, who thanked him for it and promised that he would use it in his mission school and all the schools that he taught. Gray worked quickly to establish a fund to sustain the mission schools, underwriting their debts, providing personnel funding and resources, often against public opinion. Maunsell acknowledged that Gray's material support had put his school two or three years in advance of what it would otherwise have been. In turn, Gray utilised the missionaries, networks and reputations with Māori and European leaders in the metropole and in the colony to advance his plans for racial amalgamation. In 1852, Gray wrote to Sir John Packington, the Secretary of State for War in the Colonies, celebrating the tranquility and happy state of New Zealand following the rebellion of 1846. Such tranquility, he said, was the result of two key factors. One, a sufficient armed force to put down insurrection and a large missionary body. The missionaries, he said, had advanced Christianity and civilization and prepared the uncivilized for contact with the European race. It was through the watchful care of the missionaries in converting, educating, and training Māori that racial tensions were soothed and idolatrous barbarians were won to Christianity and trained in civilized life. No efforts of the government to civilise native races, he argued, could produce lasting effects unless it is done in harmony with missionary efforts. Of particular significance were the industrial schools, which Gray believed had been the, played a vital role in imperial pacification. As it is considered that a state of half civilization is as bad as no civilization at all, the children are in respect of food, bedding, and etc., brought up in quite as comfortable a manner as the children of European peasants. In 1849, Maunsell, at Bishop Selwyn's request, wrote his book, Hints on Schools Among the Aborigines, as a resource guide to education in Aotearoa. He gave a personal copy to Gray, which he dedicated to him as, quote, a small testimony to the zeal and liberality with which he has always promoted the improvement and education of the Aborigines in New Zealand. Without, re education, without residential boarding schools, it was impossible to, quote, form those habits the native population so much needed. What was required for their wandering minds was catechization, catechization, and nothing but catechization. School began at 6.30 in the summer and sunrise in the winter and consisted primarily of scripture reading and examination, prayers, hymns, catechism, English lessons, geography, and arithmetic. And then after lunch, they spent their days working around the station. The first two years were given over entirely to industrial work with little academic instruction. Maunsell assured the CMS that not all time was spent on industrial employments, I assure you. But Māori parents complained that their children were being used for servitude. And one school inspection noted that there was a lack of academic progress, and it was due to the fact that the pupils have, quote, been for the most part occupied herding sheep and cattle. Māori fundraising for their own colonisation through British imperialism. Maunsell was emboldened by Gray's support and urged the CMS to embrace Gray's plans, which the government provided funding and, and the mission societies would supply teachers. He said the old age of conversion from heathenism 
has been superseded by the age of education, he said to Venn in the CMS. Those who were effective in the first stage are nearly useless in the new one. We now require teachers and schoolmasters, quote, give us the men and the means will be found. One group who could make assistant teachers were missionary children, he said. However, these, their education had suffered because their fathers were often away on these long journeys through these large regions. And, he said, they spent much time mixing with native children who were, quote, so slovenly, lazy, lounging and gossiping in their habits, it would be almost a miracle if their own character was not considerably impacted. The other class of labourers were native teachers who Mortal did not advise paying wages to because they might be a stimulus that appeals to their low nature. Mortal at times held optimistic views about Māori leaders and ordination, but these were most often overwhelmed by prejudiced pessimism and racist pessimism. Native teachers could not be trusted to run the school as, quote, the great bulk are very ignorant and unformed in their character. If a missionary is removed for any time, quote, a huge wave of ignorance overflows his district, matched only by the return to idleness and heathen habits. Upon return, the missionary, he said, had to basically start again. As Russell Bishop notes in his work on Maunsell, whilst Maunsell supported the ideal of ordaining Māori, in reality, he couldn't bring himself to work with them or trust them. The role of a missionary was, he said, to quote a constant war against idleness. Such work would result in pupils who were contented, industrious and obedient. Maunsell summarised the needs of a school as twofold. Gather together children for instruction to train the habits of order and obedience according to scripture, and form a taste for the diet, clothing, comforts, comforts and habits of the Europeans. The ideals Mortal outlined did not always match reality on the ground. Despite the success and growth of Mortal schools, it faced ongoing shortages. He said, our children are obliged to sleep by threes and fours in the same blanket, and we have been obliged to descend to plain potatoes for their food. As to clothes, the greater number of them are not far from being in rags. Oh, the glories of British civilization. School inspectors were surprised that anyone could, would occupy the cold and comfortless makeshift buildings of the school. Um, the, the conditions were not necessarily the result of Maunsell's negligence. He worked pretty hard in all his networks in New Zealand and Britain to raise money as well as using his own money and his own efforts to try and fundraise for the work. Sacrifice, hard work and resilience were integral to Maunsell's understanding of missionary labour, missionary calling and the gospel. Such deprivation was pedagogical. Quote, scanty however as may, our, may be our resources, we must remember that poverty is no excuse for untidiness. Life in the mission school was corrective, and this is painful. Mortal believed that Māori parents spoilt their children and neglected to discipline them. Quote, the little things are so little under constraint at home that they attend school only as caprice takes. Mortal went to great lengths to contain the children within the disciplined life of the mission station and prevent them from returning to what he saw as the lax standards of home. He believed Māori children were wild and the role of education was to tame them out of Māori habits and into British habits. Yet Māori were not passive recipients of this civilising mission. Children regularly ran away and Mortal devised elaborate schemes to catch them before they reached home because if they made it home, there was little chance of them ever coming back. When escapees were found, they were seized and brought back, brought back, quote, crying and struggling to school. One regular runaway swam across the Waikato River, a previously unheard of feat, right? Um, the outcome, the hapu withdrew all their kids from that school. Another 10-year-old boy escaped without food or water and was found 10 miles, 16 kilometres from the school, overwhelmed with fatigue and was carried back on the teacher's shoulder, quote, spitting of blood and fever. Mortal assured the CMS that, quote, once in the institution, we hesitate not to use all the discipline that we may think necessary. As the late Moana Jackson has observed at the Royal Commission of Inquiry, the roots to the abuse in care are found in colonisation and Christianity's involvement. For all Gray's assistance, none was more significant than the fast land deal that he brokered to move to Te Kohanga. Gray was passing through the district discussing education, and so Mortal invited him to Maraitai to show him the operation. And in the evening, Gray, at Mortal's request, asked Māori for more and better land, and warned that if they didn't provide it, the school would have to move elsewhere. No land was forthcoming, 
And at this, the people of Tikohanga offered a block of their most valuable land as a free gift. Gray offered to pay all the moving expenses if Morta was to move there, and he stayed up late into the night, well into the early hours, discussing boundaries and gaining signatures of the deed of surrender. The land was surveyed and the grant given just before Gray finished his first governorship, which Mortal understood as, quote, a most gracious, gracious interference of God's providence. Soon after the purchase of the land at Tukohanga, Gray was called to serve as governor at the Cape Colony. Gray's departure was a blow to Mortal. Um, Mortal believed that their shared religious persuasion was essential to what had happened in the mission schools. And with the arrival of Thomas Gore Brown, he became very fearful that he had different religious persuasions and he became a major critic of Gore Brown, particularly his heavy-handed work in Taranaki. Um, so Mortal said that um, Brown was a weak and timid do-nothing kind of man who Mortal believed was unfit for the role and he called for a new governor like Sir George whose negotiation skills would bring a solid peace within a fortnight. Well, lucky for Mortal, of course, his wishes came to fruition. Brown was removed from office and Gray returned as the governor of New Zealand for a second time. In Mortal's opinion, there was an immediate improvement of the state of affairs because of Gray's character, quote, as a skillful manager of the Aboriginal races. Since his arrival, Gray had been making plans for a visit to the Waikato, the seat of the Kingitanga. Mortal, through his influence with Watakukatai, the chief of Ngati Tipa, invited Gray to meet with the Kingitanga leaders at the mission school. Gray's inter interaction with the Kingitanga. Gray accepted, and he was hosted in the Mortal's home for the meeting. Um, he arrived to this elaborate archway that had been erected, flags were hoisted, and Gray was serenaded onto the school site with a rendition of God Save the Queen. Gray, was, Gray met with Kingitanga leaders to discuss the question of land, and Waikato Māori wanted assurances from Gray about the protection of their land, and Gray wanted assurances from the Kingitanga that they would not use force to resist land sales. Gray, Mortal said, appealed not to war or threats, but Māori, quote, character for Christianity and civilization, which they had learned in the schools. The meeting exceeded Mortal's expectations and obtained, attained the object of making known Gray's friendly intentions for enforcing the law. Through discussions, Mortal believed that, quote, Sir George fully maintained his character as a judicious and firm, firm ruler, and immediately after, he went and sent troops to Te Ia to let the King Ikanga know that, you know, there's carrot or stick. Mortal said, this bold step in every way most lawful and indeed needful has caused great concern for the whole people, but I fully expect that they will quietly submit to it. The King Ikanga obviously did not quietly submit to Gray's manoeuvres. Mortal bemoaned the low spiritual ebb in the Waikato, which had been replaced with political concerns. He delighted that Māori leaders in his area had taken to calling themselves Queenites and displayed peaceful relations with the government, pacification and ed education. For Mortal, uh, missionary education played a vital role in imperial pacification and allegiance to Christ was conflated with allegiance to British rule and superiority. He asked Watakukatai to write a letter to the Queen that would be sent on to the government that acknowledged the Queen's supremacy and stated all the points on which the Māori mind was sore, and then to ask him to go around to his other iwi and hapu to procure their signatures, of which very few did, of course. Mortal remi uh, remained loyal to Gray throughout his second governorship. Um, he believed that Gray's courageous leadership would bring a pro prompt termination to the difficulties. Um, but this wasn't the case, of course, as tensions escalated in the Second Taranaki War and then into the Waikato. Um, Mortal offered a spiritual and secular interpretation of the events to the CMS. Despite Gray's imminently conciliatory approach, Kingitanga aggressions and transigence were deteriorating the relations. From a secular point of view, Brown's mishandling of Taranaki resulted in intense Māori suspicion of the white man and fear that the immense power of Pākehā would result in Māori slavery and extermination. Then he said, From a spiritual point of view, never did a church need a more violent shaking and humbling than the Māori church. It had been invaded with the spirit of worldly mindedness, self-will and pride. Their Christianity has become lax and descended into cold formalism. Māori now obsessed over political questions and proud vauntings holding, quote, a low idea of English and an exalted idea of Māori prowess. Most deeply shall we have to thank our Lord if he pleased only to chasten and humble, not to destroy them in the coming conflict. Mortal's reports of peace in his district had to be revised within a month. Waikato had now entered the war and many of his district had as well. He was given an ultimatum to leave 
or, or remain within his boundary or leave. When um, Gray issued his ultimatum to Māori to move from Auckland or submit to the Queen and then invaded the Mangatāwhiri, Mōtō went to visit Gray in person within two days of that occurring. He's that close. And he discusses his concerns with Gray, and Gray alleviates them, and then Mōtō goes with the native minister as an emissary to Māori to tell them to yield. That's how close their relationship is. Mōtō was willing to act as Gray's emissary in support of the invasion of Waikato. Mortal often defended Gray's actions to the CMS when they raised critiques. He argued that there was, quote, no excuse for the conduct of Māori. Um, they are the most suspicious race on earth, and they use that suspicion to justify rushing into war. When the CMS disputed the reports of a conspiracy to invade Auckland, Mortal defended Gray. He had done his own careful independent inquiry and found indisputable proof of a planned attack by Waikato Māori. He shared his evidence with Gray, who then in turn cited it to his superiors in London as evidence to support the invasion. Such evidence is, of course, now rightly disputed, and the Crown recognises that the crossing of the Mangatāwhiri was an unjust invasion which breached Te Tiriti Waitangi and resulted in devastating economic and social consequences for Tainui. As the war intensified, Mōtō's safety came under threat. His family were removed, but he remained to be faithful to Ngāti Tipa, in his words. Um, he once again offered a theological interpretation of the war. God has sent the present conflict to humble his ministers and humble and chastise this proud, stiff-necked people. His hope was that it would show the better thinking among them the vileness of their forefathers' customs to which they cling, stir up the Christians among them to be more distinct and earnest, give a stronger passion for the British law and lead them away from nomadic lifestyles to live in settlements, quote, where they can be reached by the minister and the schoolmaster. Numbers crashed in the mission schools and Mortal moved to work at the front. Initially, he went to meet with the prisoners to reprove them for their sins from scripture. Um, and then he went to serve with the forces, marching with them from Mirimiri to Rangariri, where he was present for the battle. Um, for Mōtsul, the war revealed the need for education. History had shown the value of educating as a softening process for Māori, a crucial tool for imperial pacification. He argued that was what was needed was the enforcement of Māori parents to send their children to school, but the parents' indifference to education of their children was one of their, quote, crying sins, and their refusal to restrain their children's rampant self-will was the source of the present troubles. Quote, as a church, they needed and deserved the severe chastisement they are now receiving. May God sanctify the Waikato War, the invasion of British troops, to their good. By this stage in the war, and I'm coming to an end, uh, the mission schools were all but broken up. Mortal blamed the resistance of Māori parents for the failure of their schools. They rejected the disciplinary re regimes of the school and abnegated all authority over their children. Um, he said, um, you know, you're told not to touch the children in case they run away. And then he, he wrote this. And when it does run away, your object is to catch it before it reaches the parent. Once under the parent's roof, the chances are 10 to 1, you won't get it back. In these schools, you must train cleanliness, order, obedience, industry, as well as impart knowledge. Now imagine what a task that is with the wild, unbroken children, their parents backing them up in their unruly conduct. This is a missionary with now 40 years of experience. The government must adopt measures to make parents exercise authority over the children, quote, and not allow them to grow up self-indulgent, irrepressible, ignorant barbarians in the midst of European settlements. Um, Mortal in the end changed his mind on the residential schools. They were too expensive and he wanted to move to day schools and tax any Māori parents who don't bring their kids to the school. Fees were to be didactic. So in conclusion, following the Waikato War, the mission schools were empty. Before the war, there were between 700 and 800 pupils. Following the war, they had a total of 27. The 1867 Native Schools Act signalled the end of the mission school era and the uncoupling of the formal partnership between the government and mission societies in the provision of Māori education. Mission schools were the primary source of education in Aotearoa for 50 years. And we like to make a distinction between the mission schools and what the secular education. I don't think it's that simple. They provided the educational basis on which subsequent developments were iterated 
Christianity played a vital role in establishing ideological, practical, and political networks, as well as distorted theological justifications for the entrenchment of the myth of white supremacy. It is through these partnerships and networks forged in the webs of Christian empire which structured the leg legacies of educational injustice that remain with us today. Any examination of the unjust structural legacy of colonial education begins with the mission schools and the partnership of Christianity, mission agencies, and the British Empire. Thank you.